show. Today we're going to be talking with Melanie Duggan. Melanie is uh, more of a, has a different set of relationships with me uh, than uh, than patient. She's more of a friend and employee. She's actually the patient experience coordinator for uh, our Alabama project. We'll talk a little bit more about that Alabama project uh, and the the logo and the picture behind her in a few minutes. Uh, but here's the thing. Melanie went from 300 pounds to today's weight of 138. So that's a BMI of 55 down to a BMI still of 26. So she knows she's still got more, more to go. Um, and that is a huge, huge experience. It's a huge journey. We're going to be talking about that. But before we do, let's talk about some other things in terms of um, what else we're going to be covering today, what else we're going to be talking about over the next week or two. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to have a bonus comment. Um, it's about carb loading with the OGTTIR uh, insulin response survey, the Kraft insulin survey. You know, the urban myth or the urban legend around this issue is that you have to carb load. Now, actually, the myth goes both ways. Some people say, if you don't carb load, you'll, it'll look like you have artificial diabetes. Others will say, if you, if you do carb load, it'll look like uh, artificial diabetes. So uh, let's go back. We'll talk a little bit more about the details and see which one's actually the case. I just had an experience with a very, very smart patient who looks a lot of stuff up. And he, I think he got a little bit frustrated with me. Um, and you know what? He's not the only one. Uh, it goes with the territory when you do what I do. Um, at the end of the day, we found out a very interesting, and uh, at least to him, not so much to me, surprising uh, set of information evidence. So we'll cover that today. Then we'll cover that again in a couple of weeks to go a little bit more into detail because this is such an issue for so many people. I had a patient yesterday who said, Doc, I didn't get the information, so I didn't carb load. So this uh, test is all washed up, right? And again, then we talked about this study. So it's worth covering just as a, a, a headline comment today and then the details in a couple of weeks. We were going to cover it next week, but I made another last minute decision. Um, I've always had interest in vaccines and, um, you know, I started off as a public health guy. And vaccines started off uh, with uh, originally with vaccinia and smallpox. Edward Jenner figured out that if um, there was a disease that looked very much like a killer disease, smallpox, it was uh, vaccinia. He found out that if people used that, he also found out another thing, that if people used uh, old, worn out versions of a virus, and were infected to it. In other words, milkmaids, for example, were infected to a similar virus. They really didn't have problems with the ravages, the death associated with smallpox that was going through as an epidemic in Boston during that time. So that led to this whole thing of vaccines. And <clears throat> uh, just to comment about me, I tend to be I tend to be very naive in terms of politics. When uh, when this whole thing came out about the pandemic and COVID, uh, I remember, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy that, that everybody loves to hate for the government, uh, Tony Fauci, came out saying, it's going to be four years minimum before we have a vaccine. I said, mm, I think it's going to be a couple of years. I think that's, this is really going to focus folks. Um, it turned out I was right on that issue, but <clears throat> very wrong about another issue. And that was, I thought that others would share my interest in the science of vaccination. You know, there are multiple mechanisms for creating vaccines from 
just using uh, similar um, similar viruses from using similar proteins from using um, genetically uh, developed uh, components now mRNA messenger RNA and what I I knew there were folks that just didn't like vaccines what I didn't know was how politically aggressive and how common those folks are. So I made the so as I started presenting anything to do with vaccine development during the pandemic, I started realizing I was just getting dogpiled, meaning all these anti-vaxxers were tuning up. They were seeing that it was coming up. They would join the the uh, presentation, and then they'd ask they'd they'd use it as a political. Uh, uh, platform to make their political statements. They don't like vaccines. I get it. You know, that's fine. Uh, but why disrupt a discussion about the content? You know what? I'm just trying to be a doc and a, uh, and a medical scientist here. So anyhow, uh, I made the decision, whether correct or not, to just slow down on my own presentations of vaccine content. But here's what happened. I can, I continue to get a lot of questions with my, with the uh, channel participants continued to get a lot of questions from um, our community. So I just covered those during community webinars, not so much during uh, publicly uh, uh, available presentations. I've gotten so many questions about the upcoming second booster, fourth jab that I've said, okay, you know what? I'm going to put my raincoat on and go out there, go into the gauntlet and give you a little bit of perspective on what I'm seeing regarding the second booster and the fourth jab. I will, uh, we plan to present some of that information next week and we'll do a couple of things. So, uh, Gilbert has, has already uh, talked. He and I have already talked. He's going to be working on screening out the, uh, the politically oriented um, uh, questions, the political statements. I will also do the same thing. We'll still try to respond uh, to questions and comments, but it's information that people need. So a lot of folks are, are looking to, hey, Doc, what are you doing? So at the end of the day, I'll share with you what I plan to do. Um, but before I do that, I'll share with you why. So previous topics we've covered, celiac disease, is it linked to cardiovascular disease? Believe it or not, there's a very interesting and specific molecular link. If you don't believe it, go back and take a look at that, that uh, video. Uh, one of our patients came on and gave us a great uh, within the patient's eyes view of what can happen with coronary bypass. I've had multiple patients come to me and say, oh my gosh, my doctor panicked. Uh, he or she said, I really needed to have a bypass or a stent. I know you've said, you've quoted the studies, the, the, uh, the orbital trial, um, the uh, ischemia trial showing that it really does excuse me, that it really doesn't uh, stop or prevent heart attacks and strokes. But my doctor was just so scary. He believed in his surgery. I agreed to do it. And my, my statement's usually been, look, it's not that bad of an issue. It's like having suspenders in a belt to hold your pants up. And believe it or not, stents are not that, uh, they can be scary but their biggest risk associated with stents is that they get your eye off the ball, what really prevents heart attack and stroke, and that is lifestyle change, which we'll be talking about again today with Melanie, lifestyle change. We'll also be talking about procedures. Um, but uh, Lois, sh who shared her experience with coronary bypass, had a little bit different story. Her perspective was, look, you know, I knew that I had some issues. I had some things, one thing called G6PD. It's a, it's a, a type of disease that makes her red blood cells very fragile. She uh, agreed to have the, um, the study, the um, coronary angiogram. Her, as you might expect, 
she has FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. And as you might expect her, the doctor doing the um, angiogram panicked. And here's what happened. Lois is about to say, no, I don't want to have another procedure. And then she saw her daughter over in the corner also panicked. She decided to go ahead and have it done. Then she had a very significant experience associated with her G6PD. And there were many times, many parts of this experience where Lois regretted that bypass. Now she's away from it and she's got uh, some different perspectives. If you have interest, you might want to uh, check that out. So uh, if you haven't figured it out yet, we're all about helping people understand some of the things that are A, most likely to kill and disable them, and B, unfortunately, their docs are least likely to understand how to manage. For example, uh, the folks at uh, Hopkins and now Harvard and Mayo have all joined the the ranks of presenting evidence that two thirds of your primary care docs really don't understand insulin resistance. They don't, have to, no, don't know how to diagnose it, let alone manage it. So that's what we do. It's, unfortunately, it's an extremely unfortunate situation that the things that are, that are killing us, that are disabling us with heart attack, stroke, dementia, blindness, kidney disease are things that are preventable. But unfortunately, our doctors don't know yet how to warn patients of it, let alone how to help them prevent it. So that's what we do. You can get, um, you can pay us a few bucks, uh, 25 to 40 bucks for these courses, or you can get them for free. Uh, I just want to get the information out there. Um, three of the courses are very basic information, insulin resistance, plaque, and cardiovascular inflammation. Within about two hours, you can know more than 95% of doctors out there about these things, again, that are most likely to hurt you. Um, as we mentioned, Michelle works for the Jubilee Primary Care Program, the Alabama Project. Let me draw your attention before we go to, Michelle, uh, to Melanie and uh, let me draw your attention to this little image in the lower right-hand corner. That's the lighthouse in Mobile Bay. Jubilee also is a name that calls up uh, stories about Mobile Bay. There are times when, you see, there's an interesting geological uh, uh, setup. Uh, geological structure of Mobile Bay. There's a lot of, there's oil underneath the bay and there's actually carbon dioxide. There are times during the summer, late summer usually, when uh, you'll get these large bubbles of carbon dioxide. They come up out of the, the ground into the bay and fish just start coming to the edge of the water trying to get out of the, um, the hypoxic environment. And that's called Jubilee. People will uh, see this happening, they'll shout Jubilee. They'll, they and their neighbors will all go running down to the shore with their buckets and start picking up fish. That sounds like a crazy experience made, uh, a crazy story made up by somebody who's out of touch with reality. Go to YouTube and, and Google that. Uh, do a YouTube search, Jubilee Mobile Bay. So <clears throat> that's where uh, the name and the, uh, the image come from. Um, Melanie actually has a picture of that uh, lighthouse uh, behind her, and you'll be able to see that as we do the, the interview today. So I said I was going to talk about carb loading. So again, I had a patient that uh, got pretty frustrated with me. He said, Doc, you should have known this. Um, you, I did, I did a test for you, the OGTT insulin resistance test, and it showed that I had something very close to diabetes. You should have known that that was going to be the truth. Um, and that was going to be, or, or that that was going to happen, but it was going to be untrue that it was going to be a, an artificial diabetes. 
So let me get to that assumption there. As I said earlier, the glucose tolerance test um, is the definitive test for inability to metabolize glucose. And that, as we've already discussed in this presentation, is the thing that drives cardiovascular inflammation, damage to our arteries, and therefore damage to our eyes, our hearts, our brains, and our kidneys. So how do we know that that's happening? You don't feel it. As we mentioned before, at least two thirds of primary care doctors don't really understand how to diagnose it, let alone manage it. So you need a definitive test. There's the perception that if you do the glucose tolerance test without carb loading, eating a lot of carbs, at least 150 grams of carbs a day for the three days prior to the test, that it will show that you have diabetes the, and it'll be artificial. The assumption there is that your pancreas is not used to making um, uh, making uh, insulin. Another assumption is, well, you know what? You wear out your, your uh, pancreas and your pancreas has stored insulin which you don't use unless you carb load. So you really do need to carb load. So again, you look at the two different mechanisms, the two different assumptions, and yes, you can see why we've got this urban myth, this urban legend that if you don't carb load, you'll get very inappropriate, incorrect readings. So believe it or not, there was actually a clinical trial. This patient who got upset and said, I really don't have insulin resistance. I don't have diabetes like this test indicated. He found this article, but he didn't have a, um, he, he didn't have a, 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 uh, an account with the New England Journal. So he called me up, he left me a, a nasty gram and, uh, I said, okay, interesting. I, I do have one. I'll take a look at the article. And the article actually showed uh, there is no impact either way. So they tried carb loading. They also did a group of folks where they did not carb load. It did not change what they knew about the patient in either situation. So I've had two patients, again, as I said, over the past few weeks who said, oh, I didn't carb load. It's, uh, it's going to be wrong information. After sharing with them what we just found out in the New England Journal, they said, hmm, well, that's a good news, bad news situation. I have a little bit more of a problem than I was hoping that I had. So we'll go a little bit more deta uh, into detail on this um, topic in a couple of weeks after we take our drubbing from the anti-vaxxers next week. So, but that's, uh, that's carb loading for the GTT and that's um, uh, vaxxing. Let's talk about something different today. Let's talk about a massive improvement in health. At the end of the day, the number one determinant of health for the vast majority of us, not all of us, but the vast majority of us is BMI. So let's talk with Melanie about her weight loss experience. As soon as uh, Gilbert gives us the, uh, the water ball, we will uh, welcome Melanie to the, uh, to the show. So, Melanie, I, I mentioned the lighthouse. Before we get started, uh, what's that behind you there? That's our lighthouse, our logo. Thank you so much for, uh, for showing that. One of our doctor's uh, brothers painted that, didn't he? Yes. He's also a doctor. That was Dr. Clay Rayner, right? Yes, sir. Neat. So, let's get started talking about your weight loss experience 
That is dramatic. Very, very dramatic. Before we started, you were getting ready to tell me about that race. You've got a little um, number 240 pinned to the front of you. You were in a race. What kind of race was this? It was a 5K in Atlanta, Georgia. Interesting. When was it? Um, that was um, in 2020, right before the pandemic. What made you decide to to run that 5K? Um, because I knew I was about to start a, a lifestyle journey. And that was me showing myself that I could do it. There's been a, a major component of lifestyle journey, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, you were getting ready to tell me about the pain associated with that race. <laughs> my body was in so much pain because of the weight and the impact of the weight on my knees and ankles that I barely could move for almost a week. I was in because of how much weight was on me. How long did it take you to, to run that 5K? It was, it was an hour. An hour. Mm -hmm. That is not bad. You were um, 300 pounds at that point? Yes, sir. So your BMI at that point was 55. Mm -hmm. Obese is 40. Mm -hmm. And your BMI in this picture is what? 26. 26. So you still have a way to go. What? Uh, how much further are you planning to lose? Um, I want to lose about another 10 pounds. So you've lost from 300 to 138. Yes, sir. You lost half of you. I did. I don't recognize myself at all. <laughs> you don't miss that other half, do you? No, no. I'll never go back to that person again. Tell us how you got to be that person. Um, I was raised in the South where when you're eating breakfast, you're discussing what you're having for lunch. And while you're eating lunch, you're discussing what you're going to have for dinner. And there's always bread, mashed potatoes, corn, just all kinds of desserts. Uh, you know, in the South, you gather with family and eat and talk. <laughs> So I'm holding up a picture of my mom and dad. My dad in this picture, I believe, was about 250. Mm -hmm. At the time I was conceived, I believe he was about 350. Oh, wow. He's my height. He was my height, 5'10". And yes, we're from a very similar culture. I'm from we're both from the deep southeast, uh, southeastern United States. Food is a huge part of our culture. Mm -hmm. Um I've had my own 30 pound weight loss experience um, and I can only imagine what yours has been. And again, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more today. Uh, I, I remember long after I got married and I was living somewhere else, Janice and I went back to, um, to my home for Christmas. And it was such at that point in time, I could I could get a I was more at an arm's length of my culture. And it, mm -hmm. so many things just surprised me every day of the Christmas holiday. From the moment you got up, people were preparing food, breakfasts. Mm -hmm. uh, people were nibbling on or preparing food until lunch, nibbling on and preparing food until dinner and nibbling on and preparing food until another snack meal before um, you went to bed stuffed and okay. being stuffed was, you know, that was part of the holiday. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we, you have tables and you have a lot of surface area in your house, especially in the kitchen, the dining room. Mm -hmm. uh, you have dining room tables, the kitchen, the kitchen island, countertops. Every one of these surfaces was covered with pecan pie, uh, mm -hmm. Lady Baltimore cake. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's a, it's a white layer cake with a white dressing that has raisins in it. Mm -hmm. Black forest cake, pumpkin pie, mm -hmm. peanut butter fudge. Mm -hmm. Just food everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that was our culture. Um, so you got your culture from your parents. Where did, your, 
where where did your parents get their culture? From their parents. Yeah. Uh, you know, their my mom's parents, of course, grew up in the Great Depression. And I think it was you eat what's on your plate, you clean your plate type deal because of it being, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. And it was we don't waste our money, so you eat what's on your plate. And I think that came over to my parents, and then it came to to me to where you had to eat everything on your plate before you could get up from the table. That's another really good point. People that don't come from that culture, you know, you can say, well, that seems awfully wasteful to have all that food around. But as you pointed out, you can't say no. It's not that, you know, you know, the healthy thing is to say no, but you can't resist the, you know, there's a temptation. It isn't that there's a temptation. There's enforcement. Mm -hmm. Janice grew up in Pennsylvania and there was some of that in her family too, where, you know what, we bought this, you have to eat it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what were your favorite dishes? Um, I was, I'm like a pasta, sweet tooth. Um, I would cakes, ice cream, candy, carbs were all my favorite. If, you know, the stuff that you're not supposed to eat, <laughs> everything. I mean, I would eat anything and everything, honestly. And I didn't realize, you know, that there was healthy carbs and bad carbs. And I didn't realize that, you know, it wasn't okay to have mashed potatoes and corn at the same time. <laughs> well, actually, when you and I were growing up, it's only been over the past five years. And there's still a ton of people who think that, the whole thing about carbs is made up that it's not mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. um, when I started my preventive medicine, public health career, it was all about fats. Mm -hmm. There was a book that was very successful. It was called the new American diet. And <clears throat> here's what they did. The, the reason it was successful was that it took recipes that were, um, uh, that were already, very popular, but it took the fat out of the recipe. Mm -hmm. So uh, folks in my generation, which is different from yours, mm -hmm. um, grew up and as adults, we looked to get the fat out of our diet. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of folks out there who think that really what you want to do is get the fat out of the diet. And here's one of the reasons there is some, you know, behind most myths, there are some truths. Mm -hmm. One of the big truths behind um, the low fat diet is fat has much more, uh, a, a much higher density of calories. Mm -hmm. So like in a typical, what is it, a gram, uh, seven, uh, seven to nine calories uh, in a gram of fat versus four in a gram mm -hmm. of carbohydrates. So um, there is some truth to that. And fat is... Uh, is what drives some very ugly things in our metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, you had some of those very ugly things. Why don't you just. It looks like you had an interruption. There. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. Um, what was your question? Uh, you don't remember? <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, thank you for. For, I know you're taking a, some time off from work to do this and you're in. <laughs> so thanks again. So what we were talking about is body fat. Mm -hmm. Body fat has a huge impact on our health. Mm -hmm. And the body fat that you had when you were 300 pounds was impacting your health. What was going on there? Get, take us back to Melanie, five years old, 10 years old, 15, 20 years old. Uh, tell um, us a little bit more about Melanie growing up and your health? At 10 years old, I was actually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, they tested me several times to make sure it wasn't type 1 and it's type 2. Um, I was put on insulin that day that I was found out that I was type 2 diabetic and I was put on an insulin pump when I was 16. So from the time I was 16 up until October of 2020, I was on an insulin pump and then October 2020, I was able to come off of the insulin pump and was put on metformin and Lantus. 
And then in January of 21, I was able to come off the Atlantis and just take 250 milligrams of metformin in the morning and met 250 of metformin at night. Um, my A1C went down from, it used to be 10, 13, because I didn't really care. Um, mm -hmm. And it's now down to a 5.8 with just that metformin and a low carb diet and exercise. So uh, how did, how did they discover? So let me just clarify for those of us in the audience that might've missed it. Usually with diabetes, docs will tend to call or used to not so much anymore because there's more clarity and more of this going on. They used to say either juvenile diabetes or type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. You had juvenile type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify that for the uh, for us? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, well, juvenile diabetes, of course, doesn't your your pancreas doesn't produce any insulin. Your body doesn't absorb any. With type two, it will your body does produce some, but it doesn't actually absorb it like it's supposed to. Um, so that's why I had to take the insulin. Um, with um, but they would put me on because of me not wanting to take care of myself like I needed to, they would put me on Actos or the metformin with the insulin or tried Jardiance. And I was on more medication as a teenager for diabetes than an, a, a teenager should be on because of what I was eating. So let's go back to that day. You're 10 years old. You're mm -hmm. five feet. You were five feet tall at that point. Um, I was probably only like maybe Four eight then maybe. Okay. Uh, what did you weigh at that point? Um, I believe I was like probably 160, 180. Okay. Were there specific? We've talked about the culture of um, uh, that you grew up in. The the culture centered around food. We talked about. Uh, some of your favorite foods. Were there speci any specific habits that you think uh, were hard for you to break, habits that, you, that may have led you into this, especially when you were younger, when you were eight, nine, ten years old? Or um, young? I was a closet eater. <laughs> I was okay. one of those people that would uh, sneak food at night. Um, and then when I became diabetic, being told at 10 – well, you can't have this, 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 and this anymore. You're like, what? And then you're seeing all your friends eating, you know, Easter candy, Valentine's Day candy, going trick-or-treating. That was hard. Um, and watching everybody eat what they wanted, but you're not supposed to, and you don't really understand what's going on. It was kind of a really hard process to even understand at that age. And then when you get older and you go into high school and you're overweight and you're thinking, well, it's the insulin I'm taking that's making me overweight. And then you stop taking your insulin because you don't want to be fat anymore. And then your blood sugars are out of control. It was, it was a really ugly cycle that I was going through because I didn't actually understand what a true lifestyle meant at that time. So, um, was there anything that happened in terms of that visit that, that precipitated that visit to the doctor or was it just a routine visit and they saw an A1C of 13 or 10 or what? Um, Tell us a little bit more about what happened then. It was actually, my mom is, is a diabetic. She, um, she's a diabetic and my sister actually noticed that I was, I couldn't get enough to drink. It didn't matter how much I was drinking. I couldn't get enough. Um, and that I was using the restroom a lot. So she actually told my mom, she was like, I've noticed Melanie is drinking a lot and having to use the bathroom a lot. You, you might want to check her blood sugar. So my mom checked my blood sugar on her monitor and it wouldn't read. And her monitor would read up to 500. So she called her endocrinologist and he told her to get me in then. He said, bring her on. And um, that's when... I found out that I was diabetic was he, he tested me and tested my A1C and my A1C was 13. What was your actual glucose number? 
It was 800. Wow. And you were conscious. Mm -hmm. So you were not in diabetic ketoacidosis or were you in ketoacidosis? Have you been I in was. I was. He actually put me in the hospital okay. um, and um, made me, you know, gave me, I had to do like IV um, insulin to get it down. And um, he gave me fluids and everything. And then I had to learn how to take shots at 10 years old and how insulin. to put your finger. <laughs> insulin shots. Mm -hmm. So you were taking, how much insulin were you taking? Um, at that time, I was having to take uh, three to four shots a day. Of how much insulin? Um, they had me on a sliding scale. So um, I would, my mom would have to figure out like what I was eating and she would tell me what to do, what to take. And um, they had me on Lantus as well at one point with it. And I was taking 20 units of that at night on top of the three and four um, shots a day. Mm. So it was a it was a lot. So three or four shots of normally acting mm -hmm. uh, insulin mm -hmm. and then at night, a long acting. Mm -hmm. Are you on any insulin now? No. You said you went on a pump. Mm -hmm. When did you go on the insulin pump? When I was 16. 16. Mm -hmm, because my blood sugars just would not stay under control. Um with just taking insulin. I was up to um, six shots a day at that point. And she said I was about to get even more take. I was going to have to take even more shots. So she suggested that I get the insulin pump. My endocrinologist did. Okay. So I got on the insulin pump, but even with the insulin pump, I still didn't eat. Like I, in my mind, I can eat the cake and I can just eat, take more insulin. I'll be fine. That was my mindset back then. So you said uh, something about being a closet eater. Did mm -hmm. that happen? Did that happen after you were diagnosed or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was after I was diagnosed because I didn't want anybody to know that I was eating stuff I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> so you were eating out in the open until mm -hmm. you had the diagnosis and then you realized you then you said, oh, my goodness, I still want to eat. But mm -hmm. now I now it's really clear that it's not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, you've had a bypass. I did. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, well, you know what? That's the easy button. Mm -hmm. You, in fact, thought that was there was some part of you that <laughs> thought there was an easy button. Right. I did. I did. I thought that, you know, this was going to be the magic pill. I wouldn't have to really try or do anything. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, I actually, when I first started looking into it, um, the surgeon that I used, he before I could even make an appointment with him, he required that I go to a seminar to listen about the gastric bypass and the sleep. And then once I did that, I could then have an appointment with him. Once I had that appointment with him, he told me that I had to do a six month nutrition with him. I had to show that I was not going to gain one pound in six months, that I had to prove to him that this is I, that this is what I was going to do and that I was going to take ownership of it. And so if I gained a pound, I'd have to start all over again. So I said, OK, so I actually started in. October of 2019, I got approved for it in um, March. Uh, actually, it was March 31st of 2020. I got approved for it by my insurance, but the pandemic happened. So I couldn't get it until June. And I still could not lose, gain a pound during that time. He's like, no, you, if, you, if you gain, you have to start over. Um, and before I even could get put on the books for the surgery, I had to take a four hour nutrition class to teach me about which type of vitamins I'd have to take for the rest of my life and what type of um, nutrition I would have to have. And um, for the first two weeks prior to your surgery, you have to do a liquid diet. And then um, three days prior to your surgery, you do a clear liquid diet. Then two weeks after your surgery, 
or the, the day after your surgery, you get to do a clear liquid diet. You have to do a two week li uh, liquid diet afterwards. Then you get to do puree foods for two weeks. Then you do soft foods. Then you gradually can add new foods in, but your stomach will not like every food that you liked before. And it will tell you in a heartbeat that it is not going to like it and you will get sick. So you talk, you and I talked about that uh, mm -hmm. earlier. So what kind of foods make you sick now? Um, anything with sugar, um, ice cream, um, cake, um, um, depends. Sometimes I can eat chicken, but then the next day I can eat it again and it doesn't like me that day. Um, the other day, I, I mean, you've seen me eat salads plenty of times. And I ate a salad the other day and I got just as nauseated as I could be. It just something on this. I don't know what was different about that salad, but it did not like me. Um, and if I eat sugar, anything with sugar, I'm deathly ill for 24 hours. Deathly, like I, Ill. A deathly ill meaning? Uh, throwing up and, and diarrhea. Vomiting and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So and I feel like I'm having a panic attack almost. It, my heart just beats the whole time. So as you and I, as I've shared with you before, I learned a lot about this experience just by working with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been a, uh, a go natural kind of doc, always hated medications, always focused on lifestyle. And there's really good science to, to support a lot of, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of the work that I've done uh, has been with corporations. And in the early days, I remember a, uh, at a very well-known corporation, which I won't name uh, <laughs> because there's nervousness, still a little bit of nervous, nervousness around this case. There was an individual who um, was looking to get a bypass, uh, a gastric bypass, not a coronary bypass like you had the gastric mm -hmm. bypass. And, um, I had a fairly high profile at that um, at that corporation, and so the individual uh, approached me directly and um, approached the benefit. There was a benefits committee uh, as well, and uh, that benefits committee I did not sit on. Uh, they would bring in a, an outside consulting uh, doc who did mostly benefits uh, for other employers and insurance companies. Uh, whenever there was a, they didn't routinely cover bypass, gastric bypass. Um, he asked me about it and I said, you know, at that point in time, there was no data. Uh, there's plenty of data out there now. And I softened on it in the, in the following years because the data came out showing that people like you and you're not alone in this space have huge improvements in their health, mostly associated with diabetes. Mm -hmm. So I did soften and became, you know, much more of a, yeah, well, if you got to, you got to kind of perspective. But at that point in time, that information was not there. And I said, uh, I shared with the patient, with the patient, the employee, and with the benefits committee that I did not think that that was, uh, there was just no data supporting it. Mm -hmm. That individual, and you know, I've shared this story with you, that individual uh, did go ahead. The, the benefits committee did agree to that gastric bypass. He did go ahead and have that surgery. Two weeks later, he died. And here's why he died he could not make the changes that he had to make in order to support that bypass. And again, as I've, the reason I go to that story is what I've watched you do in terms of meals that we've had at work and things like that. It's not an easy place. Um, having a gastric bypass is not for sissies. No, it's not. <laughs> It's not at all because I mean, I have to, uh, every day I, I still have to think about what I'm going to put in my mouth. It's all about the lifestyle changes and 
I think about food in a different way now than I ever have about how is it going to, you know, support my body. Um, like I can tell that I haven't been eating enough protein lately because my hair is drying out. So I know I have to up my protein intake. So my body tells me when I need to do stuff, which is a good thing. Um, but you know, like I have to take so many vitamins a day. Um, I have to take, you know, I watch what I eat now. I even, you know, do my, I have apps. I've become more, um, I like to cook new things and try new foods to make them healthier instead of going and being like, oh, well, I'll just go and grab this. This is quicker. I'd rather cook now than go out to eat and grab something fast. In fact, you've got a whole different, a whole set of uh, new ways of cooking, new recipes, right? I do. And you've shared some of those with me mm -hmm. and we haven't gotten them up on the website yet, have we? We have on um, on Facebook, on our Facebook, we do a, a, a recipe every Friday. Oh, but that's the Jubilee Facebook. Correct. Page. Yes, sir. I got it. And uh, yeah, that's right. We were going to do that on the channel page mm -hmm. and then uh, the Jubilee folks took, took yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> they took over it. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your style on uh, on those new menus, those new recipes. What What has changed about the way you cook? Um, I try to find more healthier things like um, instead of using like sour cream or something, I'll use plain Greek yogurt um, to use uh, sour cream. Um, I'll put I'll do that for like a little bit of a uh, to make a dip, like a little bit of a ranch um, to dip my cucumbers or carrots in. Instead of using sour cream, I do that. Um, yesterday I was telling you I was having this. For some reason, it hit me. I wanted peanut butter M and M's. Like there's, like it was crazy. The and I was like, no, you're not having peanut butter M and M's. So I went and got a Greek yogurt and took my PB two, made some peanut butter, mixed it into that, and a little bit of the chocolate, the sugar free chocolate syrup in it, and it tasted like a peanut butter pie. I, I mean, I've changed, you know, instead of eating, going and getting those peanut butter M&Ms and being sick for 24 hours afterwards and only enjoying it for 10 minutes. I had a high protein that tasted just as good as the M&Ms would have been, but it was healthier for me instead of, you know, putting the bad stuff in my body. Like me, you have a sweets addiction, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So oh, yes. <laughs> what do you do for sweets now? You use uh, sweeteners, non-nutritive sweeteners? Um, I actually don't do a lot of sweeteners um, with my, with, if I do, I use like um, the Splenda mm -hmm. um, or Stevia. Stevia is what I use, not Splenda, Stevia. Um, if I do use any sweeteners, but most stuff I don't even sweeten because even if I sweeten something, it's still, um, it, it still, you know, upsets my stomach. Some. Oh, even I didn't know those, that. Yeah. Even with the artificial sweeteners and stuff like that. Um, so those were, and, um, another thing that I had to give up was sodas. I have not had a soda in over three years. Because, what, happens, what happens if you drink a soda? Um, it will actually cause your stomach, it get, does gas really bad and bubbles up and you get okay. like gas bubbles really bad. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't want that. So I have not, a lot of people, and I've seen this, they'll shake up their Cokes to get rid of the carbonation. And uh, still, and I'm like, it's not worth it. I just do, I'm, I, I'm just water, plain old water. How and much will your stomach hold now? Four ounces. Four ounces. So mm -hmm. tell us what that means. Is that like a half a, half a cup of coffee or something? <laughs> um, I actually weigh, uh, still to this day, I weigh my food. Um, and I will weigh it for the rest of my life. I weigh out my food and I weigh out four ounces of, and I make sure that I have more protein than anything else because, you know, protein is very important. Um, and so it keeps you fuller longer as well. But for like breakfast and I've, I've shared this with you and I've given it to, and you've tried it. I take two shots of espresso, a caramel protein shake and I mix it together and I have a caramel macchiato with 150 calories, two grams of fat and three grams of carbs in it and 30 grams of protein. And That's I it. loved it. Mm -hmm. 
You've, you shared a couple of other things with me. The, the ones I remember were sweet. I thought they were great. They mm -hmm. really fed my sweets addiction. Oh, yeah. The little frozen peanut butter cups. Right. <laughs> Those are good, too. That's uh, that's something to to get your sweet tooth from going to. And um, that, that one's really good. And you take the eight the eight ounce Cool Whip container, sugar free or, and mm -hmm. um or low fat, because they, if you look at the carbohydrates, the sugar free has the same amount as the light one does. So it, you know, so um, a lot of people that will watch this, this interview will say, Oh my Lord, cool whip. That's <laughs> really bad oils in it. Uh, they'll also say non-nutritive sweeteners. Oh, you're going to kill yourself. You know, the bottom line is, <laughs> Uh, those can have some dangers, but they're nowhere near the dangers of, of the diagnosis that you were carrying the body. Mm -hmm. fat. You were carrying. Oh yeah. Cause I, I was, uh, I wasn't going to last much longer. My body wasn't going to last much longer. And, uh, I've done things now that I never thought I would ever do. I've gone kayaking. I, I travel more. I mean, I've been to Ohio and went to the zoo and I walked the whole zoo and I didn't have to sit down for my back hurting or my knees hurting or my legs hurting. I'm doing a 5k with my son for the first time in April. Um, having him do his first 5k. He's eight years old. Um, so I've changed. My life has changed because of it. And I mean, I, I'm thankful for the surgery. And like you said, a lot of people think it's the easy way, but it's not because you, it can be taken away from you at any minute. I can gain the weight back anytime. If I don't continue to weigh my food, watch what I'm putting in my mouth. And I mean, it's a struggle every day. Just like if I was, I mean, because I, I tried Weight Watchers. I tried, I did the, um, and I, I told you about this where I worked out for two years <laughs> The, the only day I didn't work out was Friday. I kept counting my macros, did everything I was supposed to. And then two years, I had only lost 80 pounds. Mm. And then when, you know, and I was still working out, I started gaining weight back for some reason. And I gained back plus more than what I had lost. And that's when I ended up being 300 pounds. You know, a lot of the folks that watch the channel really, they get a lot out of hearing uh, other individuals that have had problems talk about these issues. Um, and for example, we, were, we had a group uh, yesterday talking about LDL, mm -hmm. uh, quote, bad cholesterol. And it, it was a group of six people on the, uh, on the discussion. Two of the six people had had LDL levels, 200 to 400 levels. I mean, really high. And so people get a very different understanding. Things sound theoretical until they actually talk to or, or hear or see people that have had health issues mm -hmm. um, that we're talking about. Uh, have, had you had any serious health issues uh, other than the diabetic ketoacidosis? Uh, my cholesterol was high. Um, it's, it's down now. Um, I would, um, I could, I could tell that my heart was not doing a hundred percent because it was pumping for a huge body <laughs> and mm -hmm. my dad has heart issues. And so does my mom. Both of them have had bypass, heart bypasses. Um, so I knew I had a change or I, or I was going to end up like them. And I did not want my health to end up like them at all. So you talk about that, and here is some one of the more graphic risks. I won't go into a deep dis, uh, description of it. I, I don't need to. It's just the idea is graphic mm -hmm. in and of itself. There was one of my younger uh, cardiovascular patients came to me, had a, a situation similar to yours, except that he had type 1 diabetes, not type 2. And he was ignoring his diabetes mm -hmm. until he went into the hospital. Um, his A1C at that point was either 14 or 17. I mean, oh, it was wow. a really big number. And the reason he was in the hospital was he had a, um, what we call a, a necrotizing fasciitis. What that means is, um, the tissue, uh, 
and, and on large areas of tissue were dying. And the tissue was um, in the area uh, of, in the area under his pants. It was mm. just an incredibly difficult uh, challenge. And people don't really realize, uh, you know, they, they think somebody's young and healthy, even if they have diabetes, it's not mm -hmm. an issue. Well, it can be a very big issue mm -hmm. very fast. Yeah, because I used to get um, the abscessed, um, the little abscessed. I used to get them like near my groin area and underneath my arm. But since I've lost so much weight, I don't get them anymore because of my blood sugars. I've controlled my blood sugars so well now. Um, I don't even know. I mean... I don't even think my blood sugars go over 120 anymore, even after I eat. Excellent. That's very good. So you're monitoring that now? Mm -hmm. I'm, have, I still <laughs> Have you used the Freestyle Libre? Or just um, I have, but it won't stay on my skin for some reason. So I got the um, Dexcom 6. Oh, you did. That's right. I, I remember I that. did. And I got to get you to program it for me when you get here <laughs> so uh, I can use it. I'm not the greatest Dexcom programmer. I've used the Dexcom and the Libre. I used them at the same time. Actually, you know, most people get much better results from the Dexcom. Mm -hmm. It costs a lot more. I actually got better results from my Libre when I used it. And I just still don't know why, but it is what it is. Right. So this has been a great discussion of your health, uh, your health journey, uh, Melanie. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. It takes a lot of guts to go through what you've gone through. Um, it takes a lot of, uh, of guts to share that story, but even more to go through what you go through. I, any advice, things that you would share with me or others who are listening? It is a lifestyle change. It is. It starts with wanting to do it and determination. And if you can do it for 21 days, your body's going to be used to it after the 21 days and you can keep doing it. I literally make it a point that I go walking in the morning for 15 minutes with my dog. And then when I get up or when I get home, I make it another point to walk another two miles. So I get at least three miles in a day and I make sure that I move. That's every day. Every day. Rain or shine. Rain or shine. If it's raining, I go to the gym. If it's nice and pretty outside, I go around the apartment complex and I even make my son go with me because I want him to understand the lifestyle change. And he loves my lifestyle change. He loves that I get can be out there and be active with him and not say, well, we got to go, buddy. My mom's back's hurting. You know, I, I'm too tired to play with you. I, you know, I won't fit on that. It's it's fun now to be his mom and be able to be active with him. But it. It's definitely, it's a struggle, but to do it, but it, it's worth it in the end. So some of the things I, I take away is that, you know, the lifestyle change is going to happen one way or another. Mm -hmm. It's got to happen. Mm -hmm. It cannot not happen. Exactly. Uh, some people see a surgery, you know, whether it's coronary oh, yeah. bypass, uh, we've got a feedback there. Uh, whether it's coronary bypass or uh, gastric bypass, you're still going to have to make the um, the lifestyle changes. And that, in fact, is mm -hmm. one of the big dangers, the assumption mm -hmm. that you don't. Mm -hmm. um, as with and, and, you know, making lifestyle changes is not for sissies. Having oh, no. surgery is not for sissies. Mm -hmm. No, because, I mean, like I said, you can you can gain it back just as fast as you lost it. So like most of our um, of our visitors, there's just so many other questions that uh, that I'd like to ask. For example, you know, what do you do with carbs uh, versus fats? We've had one of those questions on our diet. Uh, actually, let's go ahead. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the um, we'll let you answer that question when it comes up. But first, uh, uh, Gilbert, will you give us the transition and we'll do a little bit of Q&A?
So we're going to go into some Q&A, and rather than just finish the uh, interview, there's a couple of questions on here that I think you need to, to help us with. Okay. So Don Barry says, I'll be back. And <laughs> my response was, that sounds like Arnold in The Terminator. Um, so Don, before I go, doctor, just mention I'm the metabolic disaster survivor. Losing weight was the beginning and not at 74 four years old. I'm good in all areas uh, and only about 20 pounds off of perfect. Well, what did you say your goal is, Melanie? You're at 138. I'm at 138. I want to be um, 125, 128. So you're about 10 to 15 10 off. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth West Side. Hi, Dr. Brewer. I had to leave temporarily, but if it hasn't been addressed, what do you think of low carb and low fat to force your body to burn its own excess fat. So what do you think? And I will, I'll make some comments afterwards. Um, well, for me, I do low carb and low fat all in one. Um, I try to stay away from like the, the bacon and sausage and different, you know, a lot of, I, I mean, I'll use cheese, but I try to stay away from, you know, the really fatty cheese. Um, I think that it, you know, it, it's honestly what what you put in your body is going to help, you know, with the excess fat, but also with like exercising because it can't just be food um, because you're going to have that belly fat. If you just do food, you're not going to have like you're not going to actually lose the actual belly fats and stuff if you don't exercise as well. OK, that's helpful. And here's my perspective from where I stand in my background. It's very similar. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's been debates, gosh, for decades. When I first got into uh, uh, a health profession, preventive medicine at Johns Hopkins, it was all about avoiding fat. You know, everybody always said diet, diet, diet. There's not been much argument over the relative importance of diet in terms of uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. There's not been much uh, argument or debate over the importance of lifestyle. The big problem is nobody wants to make the lifestyle changes. That's the biggest issue. But in terms of what we know, no argument. Lifestyle is the biggest thing. Unless you go to a doc and the doc's used to doing surgery or, or prescribing pills, then again, you go down that path. Then once you get to the diet issue, 30 years ago, it was all low fat, low fat, low fat. And then some things happened. Um, a lot of people started having success with that Scarsdale diet, which is a keto diet. Mm -hmm. Then that started getting a lot of press. People were very concerned about it. I was worried about it at that point because of the amount of fat in the diet. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I think that Scarsdale doctor got shot. Isn't it, that the one? Anyhow, I'm so sure. this fellow died. He left a lot of money for some good trials, randomized clinical trials for diets. And randomized clinical trials for diets are very, very hard because people have to agree to have their diet randomized for months. It's not easy to find a whole lot of people that will agree to have their diet randomized for months. You just don't see it. And so that's one of the reasons that there's such uh, difficulty finding good good evidence behind it. But anyhow, some of the some of the really good dietary trials did come out as a result um, of that funding. And what they indicated was, no, keto diets are not unhealthy like many of us feared. And in fact, they did appear to be effective. So one of the things that you'll find with a keto diet is that <clears throat> um, there's a lot of water weight loss in the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of water weight gain the minute you fall off of it. Mm -hmm. But um, that's one of the downsides. Um, but as you continue to look at it, it does appear to be more effective at weight loss. Now, I would agree with you, though. Um, <clears throat> Coming out on the other side and having a lot of experience with patients as well as myself in both of those types of diets, you really need both. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a lot of people out there 
um, that focus on low fat diet and they complain. They say keto diet's not good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is that's not true. It is a good diet. Um, the, the keto folks, the low carbers, and I tend to fall more in that camp than, than the other. Um, they would say, look, it's not the bank account theory. The bank account theory is it's calories in versus calories out, and there's nothing else going on there. The reality is that's not true. There's a huge component. We're human beings, and there's a human, huge component of endocrine impact. Mm -hmm. Insulin plays a huge part of what goes on with us. And insulin stops fat burning. Uh, insulin is stimulated by carbs. So uh, if you read a couple of books by a great endocrinologist, Robert Ludwig, I mean, Robert Lustig and David Ludwig, Lustig is an endocrinologist that's run the obesity program at uh, UC, I think it was UC San Diego. It was one of the, or UC San Francisco. David Ludwig is a great endocrinologist who's run the obesity program at Harvard. Both of them have written books about the endocrine impact, the hormonal theory of weight loss. And they show that it, it's really insulin. Insulin is incredibly powerful. At the end of the day, <clears throat> I'm a, a cardiovascular preventionist. I want people to stop burning up their arteries. And that happens most of all from one of two things, increased glucose or increased insulin. Mm -hmm. Both of those happen due to the same things, carbs in the diet. Uh, fat in the diet doesn't stimulate either one of those. However, one thing that does happen is body fat is a major driver of these problems as well. So at the end of the day, uh, diet is critical, but it's not so simple after that. You need to keep the weight off, minimize body fat, and minimize that daily uh, excursion up to 160 and above hour after hour of blood sugars. So... Again, yours was far more succinct, and I think both of us would agree at the end of the day, it's both. Rick Fol Folia, is soy an inflammatory or miracle food? Uh, I think the folks that would say the, the biggest critics of soy have to do with uh, some seed-related issues. Most of all, they have to do with some, again, hormonal-related issues. I am not a soy uh Specialist, I'm not going to be able to answer that question. So I'm going to just acknowledge that and move on. Bart Robinson, good morning, everyone. Good morning to you, Bart. Hervaj Zujic, greetings from Munich, Germany. Thank you, Mr. Zujic. Thank, thanks for sharing where you're from. Joe Schwartz, good morning, Dr. Brewer, and greetings to all. Margaret D., good morning from Winnipeg, Canada. Mahmoud Eld. Good morning, Jill, or Mahmoud I. I lost 30 kilograms in a year's time. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. A kilogram is not a pound. Mm -hmm. How many pounds to, kil to a kilogram, you know? 2.2 pounds. So that is what? Um, 60, 60, more than 60 pounds. 60 pounds. Yeah. That's a big deal. Congratulations to you, Mahmoud. Tired looking for name, $20 super chat. Thanks for all the great work to Dr. Brewer and PrevMed team. Thank you so much, Tired. And for those of you who are, are watching, if you do a super chat um, up in the upper right-hand corner. Gilbert shows you how to do that. Um, there are other ways to contribute to the channel. And as you can see, basically what we're doing is we're providing content. Um, a little bit less than half of it is consumed by the U.S. The rest of it is consumed by the rest of the world looking at Oh, what keeps us healthy? E.T. himself, Aconagon Valley, B.C. here. E.T., you've been on with us a lot. I hope I pronounced your hometown right. Aconagon, Aconagon, not sure. Don Stewart from Tennessee. There are no essential carbs. Get off of carbs and sugar. Went from 190 to 145. I'm 5'8", so the BMI is good. I'll tell you what. 
that's a big, big deal, Don. Con mm -hmm. Congratulations to what you've done. Mahmoud Eid, hello from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. And as you can see from the commenters, again, uh, this content's making an impact for people all over the world. Awandro, Awandro Magalis, uh, Dr. Brewer, thank you for everything you do. Thanks to you, I'm in much better shape. Thank you so much, Awandro, I appreciate that. Fort Worth West Side, Don, are you strictly carnivore? Um, uh, Melanie, are you familiar with the carnivore diet? Um, is that all meat diet? Yeah, it's it's <laughs> only, only stuff that you kill. Oh so, no! <laughs> for the face, <laughs> the, you know the plant uh, the plant based guys originally termed that that don't eat anything with a face. Well, mm -hmm. the, the carnivores only eat things. <laughs> Awandro, one question for you. My weight and triglycerides have plateaued. I'm doing mostly low carb, uh, high fat with intermittent fasting, 16 and 8. Would I benefit from going paleo and cutting out cheese as well? You know, it's interesting the sort of things that get people off of paleo. I mean, get people off of a plateau. Sometimes it's an exercise thing. Sometimes it's adding more uh, high intensity interval work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's doing a prolonged fast, adding a full day of fasting into the week. But we've got an expert on weight loss here. <laughs> Melanie, what, uh, I'm sure you've hit some plateaus. Oh, I've, plateaus I've hit plenty hit? of plateaus. Um, I was actually on one for about three months where I would not get below 140, and it was aggravating the crap out of me. Um, and I actually upped my... Um, my walking. Um, and that's when I started going in the morning and at night and getting at least three miles instead of doing one to two, I upped my walking. So it actually helped me finally get below that plateau by adding a little bit more exercise into my regimen. I and think body, yeah, body fat has a brain and I mm -hmm. think it is very, <laughs> very, uh, tough. It mm -hmm. is, uh, it, it bears down and it's hard to make a change. Mm -hmm. But what you did was you made a change in your lifestyle, a significant mm -hmm. change. How, you went from what level of walking to what? Um, I was only doing about one to two miles uh, or one to one and a half to two miles a day. And I've gone up to like between three and four. Um, depends on how, what I have to get accomplished after work, depending on how much I get, you know, uh, how much I walk. Well, and if you just think about just plain physics, uh, uh, you know, one of the questions that comes up to me, well, if you're pushing a lot more weight, one mile became much less of an issue after you lose another 20 pounds or so. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, plateau breaking stories? Um, I upped my protein intake. It helps as well. It helped a lot as well to, to drop the weight. Very good. I've uh, I've gotten great, uh, great uh, experience for, from changing those macros a little bit more. And again, I get more uh, the more I can get uh, carbs out of that diet. Mm -hmm. And yes, sometimes even getting fat out of that diet, the uh, the more effective it becomes. Awandro, I've also heard Dave Feldman say that closing the window one hour earlier. This is on an intermittent fasting, at least uh, last meal at 6 p.m. rather than 7 drastically lowers triglycerides and LDL readings. Worth trying? Uh, definitely worth trying. I have a lot of folks that have dawn effect problems. I usually counsel folks not to get too concerned about dawn effect because, uh, Melanie, are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. A lot of diabetics are, uh, and a lot of folks, about one in, varies between one in 20 and one in five, will have high blood sugars early in the morning before they eat anything. Hmm. And for the most part, it's not really a high blood sugar that, that does the level of damage. You know, mm -hmm. the, the evidence would indicate you probably need to get up to 140 or higher uh, to get significant damage. Very few people we know, we've talked about that you know somebody who had a, a fasting glucose much higher than that. Mm -hmm. But very few people get uh, fasting glucose levels uh, significantly over 120. 125 fasting glucose is one of the criteria for full-blown type 2 diabetes. So um, anyhow, 
I went down a bunny hole. The reason I went down that bunny hole was I have a lot of folks with uh, Dawn Effect who say, you know what, I'm going to move my last meal earlier in the evening and it has an impact on the Dawn Effect. It can also have a significant impact on that triglycerides uh, and um, HDL. And I'm wondering if you meant triglycerides and HDL or triglycerides and LDL. Uh, Turgaderia, cut sugar and alcohol. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, those are big deals, Turgay. Thank you. Black Tengu, Dr. Brewer, does berberine have any effect on LP little a? Don't know the answer to that. Um, the, what I'll see, what I will tell you, I've got a whole lot of people with LP little a issues. Uh, another new one just yesterday. What you do see is that LP little a is, uh, it can be very confusing. One of the theories that's come up and I think has some validity is that LP little a may have some uh, role in trying to heal damage within that lining of the artery wall. So quite often, excuse me, quite often you'll see increased LP little a is associated with um, increased inflammation. And I do tend to see that pattern. Um, so you tend to see it more associated with decreasing cardiovascular inflammation and decreasing LP little a. Now there's one supplement that does usually have a significant impact on LP little a it's called niacin. And for those of you with this, with this issue, with this interest, we've got plenty of videos on it. So to get back to your specific question about berberine, theoretically berberine could help because berberine is considered to be one of those uh, pre-diabetic insulin resistant uh, supplements that helps in that space. However, it helps little enough to where I can tell you, I personally have not seen a pattern where my LP little a patients suddenly get better with berberine. And I, it's not one of the recommendations that I make. So, Oh, I think some of that was, uh, I skipped over Winnie. So Winnie and Black Tengu were asking that question about berberine and LP little a. Uh, Melanie, are, are you familiar with LP little a? I'm not. Do you remember the show, The Biggest Loser? Mm -hmm. Do you remember Bob Harper, the trainer? Mm -hmm. He had a heart attack in his early 50s, even I though he that. was. And about a week after he had that heart attack, he came out and said, it was from LP little a. LP little a is a genetic variation of LDL. And he got that from his mom. Hmm. And docs have known this. They, they've known, they discovered that LP little a was a significant risk factor for heart attack and stroke <clears throat> decades ago. But typical, has any doctor ever looked at yours? I don't think so. Uh, most docs don't even know to look for it because they don't even know about it. Because docs felt like, well, there's not really much you can do for it, so don't even look. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's, I'm not going to go down that trail, but I thought I would, uh, I'll leave it at that point. LP little a is a killer. Best solution, low blood sugar level. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that are coming out with LP little a now. There's a thing called anti-sense drugs. And for those people that are afraid of uh, genetics, uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see if they're afraid of the, the anti-sense drugs with LP little a, but those drugs have been doing very, very well. Um, as we discussed many times, niacin also has a very positive, tends to have a very positive impact in about two thirds of folks, which have LP little a. Iwandro, oh gosh, a $50, um, I saw that earlier, Iwandro, thank you so much. That's a, again, a super chat. Um, you can find that down at the bottom if you'd like to do that. What that does, Awandro has contributed $50 to, uh, to an effort. I basically support this channel with, uh, with seeing patients, uh, mm -hmm. supported from our, our life savings and, um, charges that I, that I get from patients, uh, that come to see me individually. And uh, that, pays uh, Gilbert's salary and Aspen's and uh, Dr. Jesus's and several others. So okay. but we, now we've got some help from folks like Awandro and, and uh, I think LPG and several other uh, folks that have made some very, very uh, 
gracious contributions. We had another one today, tired looking for name, has, has, has made several. So ET himself, uh, thumbs up. We've got one thumbs up so far. That's, uh, that's frustrating. Uh, if you could think about just clicking that thumbs up and it doesn't cost you anything. Amazing pictures of Melanie. I would agree. <laughs> Melanie said, you know, Melanie said, Oh, I don't even like looking at that picture. <sighs> I, I can understand. I wouldn't want to either, but gosh, I, you know, that's one of the things that I said earlier. It takes guts to get on a show like this and share that story. But that, information is so helpful to other people. We really appreciate what you did, Melanie. Congratulate Bob Bell. Congratulations, Melanie. Have you managed your excess skin after weight loss? Very, very interesting mm -hmm. question. I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Um, I have excess skin. Um, I will have to have plastic surgery to get it all taken care of. Um, and uh, hopefully I can get it done eventually because I still see I think once I actually get the excess skin off I'll actually see all of the hard work that I've put in because with the excess skin I still see the 300 pound person staring me back at me because I just see all of it there so it just kind of it's a little irritating sometimes but it's okay it, it's it's battle wounds I say <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Ewandro, amazing results, Melanie. Uh, Jonathan Hull, good morning, Dr. Brewer. How did Melanie's cholesterol respond to losing weight? Has she needed to take a set? By, way, by the way, huge congrats. Um, I don't take any statins besides, well, the metformin, but that's not really a statin. Is that a statin? That's not a statin, is it? No, that's not no. a statin. Okay. No, I don't take any statins. Um, I've never had to take a statin, thank goodness. Um, but no, I've no, I um, haven't had to take one, even with the weight loss and my cholesterol um, and vitamins and everything are great. So you don't have to take any kind of vitamin supplementation uh, after oh. your bypass? Mm -hmm. I have to take, uh, I take two Flintstone complete vitamins a day, a B12 shot a month, a D3 once a day, a B1 once a day. Um, a calcium supplement. Do you happen to know what your cholesterol level is? I do not know, but they said it was good. <laughs> I'd have to look at it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, Gilbert, I think, put up a place where you can find some more videos, more, more content. Bart says, wonderful job, Melanie. Huge respect. And you are an inspiration. Thank you so much, Bart, Thank for that you. comment. I appreciate that. Black Tengu. I wonder if Melanie could have lost her weight without a gastric bypass. I tried. I mean, I lost some, um, but I would fall off the wagon and go right back to my bad habits. And with, because I wasn't losing it, like, I guess I wasn't I, I never got below 200 when I was trying the, when I got, when I lost it naturally. And I guess not ever seeing myself below 100, I got discouraged and I got, and since I'm now below 150, I mean, I can't believe I'm below 150 half the time. I have more of a, of a want to stay this size and not go back. Um, but I did try several different things weight watchers um they gave me um they did trilicity ozempic um they put me on um it was some kind of weight loss pill that made your heart race and you're you felt like you were jittery all the time and you're not supposed to eat but you have all this energy but i felt like crap on it <laughs> I mean, I, they would just put me on different medicines to try to get me to, to lose weight. And it I, I didn't want to have to be on all the medicines anymore. So I felt like it was my best bet was to do the gastric bypass. I would just make a comment again from the medical side. Uh, and again, even though, as I mentioned earlier, I've always been a doc who discourages medications, discourages procedures. There's no question. There's, there's, a 
huge amount of addiction science out there. And um, there are times for medications, there are times for procedures, and I'll leave it at that. Margaret D., lifestyle is important with or without medical interventions. I would agree, Margaret. Thank you so much. Carmen Hammond, congratulations. Great transformation. Fantastic determination. I would agree. Um, Melanie, I mentioned earlier, is the uh, patient uh, experience coordinator for Jubilee. And I can assure you uh, she is very determined, incredible work ethic. And I've met her dad, and he <laughs> takes all the credit for it. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> Ewandro, can you share some of those recipes with us as well? I can. If Dr. Brewer wants me to put them on the web on the PrevMed, I'll be more than happy to share them with everybody. If you will send those to me, I will mm -hmm. send those to um, to Michelle, and we'll see if we can get those up there. Okay. They even have the nutritional values and everything on there. Melanie's Perfect. recipes. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth, how effective would a low carb and, and low fat work for making your body burn its own excess fat to get its energy? Well, um, I don't know. I think we've covered that. Do you mm -hmm. have anything else to add? Mm -mm. Cameron, you look beautiful and healthy. Thank you. It's from the vitamins. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought they were talking about me. Oh, well, probably. <laughs> probably so. <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> Pardon me, I couldn't, couldn't resist giving you a hard time. Don Stewart, my love, wife lost 100 pounds over the last year mm -hmm. by going on keto. No sugar and not more than 10 carbs a day. She feels great. That's good. Stefan Ivan, my dad is 60% carotid stenosis. Do you recommend surgery? What tests should we do to know if he has soft or hard plaque? By the way, I'm from Romania. We use a test called CIMT, carotid mm -hmm. intima media thickness test, and the bottom line is, no, the, I, I actually, in my first year of medical school, worked with a fellow named, uh, I think it was Jenkins, a Dr. Jenkins, and he was known as the carotid endarterectomy doctor. Uh, he did tons of them. They didn't work. Uh, there are still occasionally carotid endarterectomies done. But here's the thing. Um, those don't prevent strokes, just like... Um, Bypass graft doesn't pre prevent heart attacks. Lifestyle prevents it. And again, it, it's, we've got, that's what this whole channel's about. Uh, Bob Mester, very inspiring. What a journey back to good health. Uh, let me take a look. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to the rest of these. I've got, in fact, we're not. Um, let's just cover a couple more real quick and then we're going to have to say goodbye. Uh, Winnie, Don Stewart, have to do the same. Kudos to your wife, Bart Robinson. A reminder for everyone to hit the like button. We're still at one like. Oh, gosh, please, folks, just give us a, a like. We would appreciate it. It'll help the AI get that content out there. Thank you so much, Bart. Appreciate it. Beef, butter, bacon and eggs. That'll do it. Sounds like a keto guy to me. <laughs> hungry, Don. Um, Last comment, Winnie. Thank you, Don. I'll do it here in Holland. So happy I found Dr. Brewer. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And we are so happy that we found Melanie. She's been doing some great work for the Jubilee team. And she did a great job today on sharing her story with the channel. Thank well, you. Thank Mel. you for having me. I appreciate it.